welcome to Quench Live here on Facebook. We're bringing you the world of food and drink. In today's environment, we're trying to showcase everything that's happening within the food and drink industry, as well as trying to bring you some updates of uh, what's uh, opening and what's closed. So today, I'm actually going to talk to you a little bit about what I have in my cellar. And one of the reasons why people always ask me as editor of Quench, what is in my cellar is because they think I have some sort of insight into uh, what's the best. And sometimes we do get really extraordinary tastings. We've been invited to some of the best chateaus and properties across the world. But at the same time, there are these kind of, uh, well, like you say in French, the coup de coeur that we love to drink on a continuous, um, on a continual basis. And this is what I'd like to showcase to you today. Not necessarily those uh, of the most expensive wines, but some that I enjoy on a regular basis because they have something that I'm always looking for. So let's get to it. Actually, one of the first ones was this really great wine from BC, Les Petales de uh, Asoyos. This is from the Asoyos La Rose uh, property in BC. And one of the reasons why I love this wine is simply because it has the one of those amazing flavor profiles that you find across BC. It's something that you don't really find in other wine growing areas uh, across uh, Canada. It really has something to do with the uh, desert climate that um, where Asoyas is. And it, what it does is it, it creates these kind of uh, ripe but fruity and, and with the complexity that still has, uh, you know, a longevity to it. The Petal de Asoyas, that's the, well, their second bottling. The uh, Asoyas La Rose wine itself is an exceptional wine but this second bottling has something that and i hate to use the term um table wine but it's that kind of ideal wine that goes with food and this is actually one of my favorites simply because year in and year out the vintages have a, a strong depth to them and you're getting all those kind of jammy cranberry uh, notes with um, with along with that nice um, tannin that's at the medium uh, bodied level and but still has uh, that acidity that matches well with a lot of food. So definitely Petal de Osoyos from BC, one of my favorites. Um, the next one, and when I was talking before about the coup de coeur, the Dogajolo from Carpinetto, this is definitely one of my favorite wines. And for me, a favorite wine means something different than I think most people. Um, I think when you taste as much as we do here at the magazine, you do get a lot of different wines coming across uh, our, our desks that are, that have a, a level of complexity that's that's uh, incredible, and also they have kind of that uh, that tannin acidity balance that we're always looking for, especially here at Quench when we're looking for wines that are matching perfectly with food. But for the Dogajolo, this one here, year in year out, the vintages are exceptional. They're it's not a super complex wine, but it has that kind of nice leveled simplicity that you love, again, for that terrible term, table wine. It's that everyday wine that I enjoy at, uh, I think it's about $16 here in, in Quebec. Uh, it has everything that I search for when I'm trying to enjoy a red wine with food. From Italy, uh, Northern Italy and Tuscany, it has um, that perfect balance between the acidity and the tannin, especially, I mean, this one here is a 2018. 
even the younger vintages still seem to have a nice even balances to them. And I've had actually, uh, because we served them at uh, my wedding, we were I was able to kind of uh, get the 2007 bottlings with the year of our wedding, the large magnums, and we tasted it la uh, a couple of years ago for our 10 year anniversary. And it was still exceptional. It was still standing up. So young or a little bit more older, this wine stands the test of time and is solid uh, for everyday drinking. And I enjoy it quite a bit. The last one is one of my new finds, and it's the Hans Baer Pinot Noir. The reason why I love this wine and wines like it is because it is 12.5% alcohol. Now, wines these days have been uh, gaining in alcohol percentage to a point where it's it's become almost unbearable. At 14% to 16%, that's too much alcohol to have in a wine. It doesn't pair well with a lot of different foods. And so you're struggling against that wine constantly. That's the problem with high alcohol wines. But when you're finding these low alcohol wines, and in Quebec, we're finding quite a, a number more than we have over the past couple of years, as well as Ontario, BC, and Alberta. I've been working hard to get these essentially low alcohol level wines, 12 to 12 and a half percent, even at 13, you're kind of scraping the limit of, uh, of a wine that it can, is easily uh, matched with foods. At 12 and a half percent, it sits perfectly. You have to remember that most wines, when delivered, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a range in which the alcohol is delivered at, right? When it says 12 and a half percent, well, it's actually plus or minus one to one and a half points. So it means at 12 and a half percent, it could be coming in at uh, 13 percent uh, to 13 and a half percent. But at 12 and a half, it's ideal for any uh, meal that you're having, whether it's uh, a complex steak or uh, something with a nice level of fattiness to them or something spicy. Actually, uh, uh, we enjoy these quite a bit with a lot of the Japanese and Thai cooking that I'm doing these days. So this one here, this Pinot Noir from, uh, oh, where is this actually? This is up from uh, Germany. I keep forgetting that, uh, that this one here is actually from Germany. And this Pinot Noir, so easy to drink it's uh it, it's it's really a liquid gold when it comes down to it so i love low alcohol wines if you can get your hands on more of them i suggest enjoying them especially enjoying them young because higher alcohol uh, levels will allow for the wines to age and kind of uh, um, be able to grow over time so 12 and a half percent exceptional wine. Let's not keep talking about table wines. You know how much I hate that word. Now, when it comes to everyday enjoyment, Sailor Jerry rum, I can't say enough. Complex vanilla, tons of clove and all that kind of juiciness that you get from spice rum. I love it. Now, I'm a huge fan of the tattoo artist Sailor Jerry. That's what first attracted me to this bottle. But once I got a taste of it, I stayed. This is something that I have with uh, with ginger beer, actually, uh, for uh, Dark and uh, Stormy. Uh, an exceptional cocktail for everyday drinking. I'm, I'm discovering ginger uh, now more and more, and I enjoy having that with this kind of a complex spiced rum. It's really quite a good bottle. And for every day, whenever I'm having a little bit of a tummy ache, the Fernet Braca. Now, for those of us that have worked in bars before, and I've worked in several uh, bars, restaurants, in kitchens, as well as front of house, and we all kind of have fallen in love, uh, love with Fernet Braca to a point where it's it's in all of our uh, all of our you know, bars, essentially. We, we use it because it has that super complex Amaro 
that I love. Now, I drink it sometimes on its own uh, in, as a digestif, but I'll also have it with Coke. And if any one of you has been to uh, Argentina, uh, where uh, the Italian population is actually even greater sometimes than in Italy, uh, they love Fenne Braca with Coca-Cola. So that is my recommended cocktail for this uh, for this uh, week. If you get a chance to have a bottle or maybe you, you have a dusty bottle somewhere in the back of your bar, go ahead, kind of polish it off and have it with about, it's one to one and a half ounces of Fenne and then uh, two to four ounces of Coca-Cola or any cola. So that one there, highly recommend it. Please try it. If you can, leave some comments in our Facebook uh, feed and tell us, you know, what else you'd like to see from face uh, from Quench Live as we bring you what's happening in the food and drink industry over the next little while. Now, before I close off, I wanted to tell you, you know, what we have planned for the next couple of episodes. Now, we're trying to do this on a much more regular basis. We had a chance to talk to our... Uh, our BC specialist about what was happening these days in the uh, BC wine industry. And not only that, what uh, the wineries themselves are doing in order to con uh, connect directly with the consumers. Now, a lot of them have uh, up their winery uh, club game. And so you can find a number of Canadian wineries these days that are delivering across the country and that are bringing uh, the they're the best that they have uh, to directly to your doorstep. Now, the winery clubs are really quite fun and interesting to do on a much more regular basis, and that's because they're able to kind of bring you two or three different bottles that you might not necessarily have thought of buying in the beginning. I remember that wineries are trying to clear some of their inventory so that they can move into the, this year's bottlings. So it's always good to look and shop local to BC, Nova Scotia, Quebec, or Ontario and Niagara and look to those winery clubs in order to uh, you know get yourself a case or two of these exceptional wines. Now, one of the other things that's changing quite a bit, and we talked to Tim about that, was also how the restaurants themselves are are upping their their delivery game. And so a number of restaurants are now not only creating packages, but they're creating takeout menus. And wine and beer is an ideal key part to that. And so you're going to be seeing a number of different restaurants whether they're your local restaurants or simply restaurants that um, that are just a little bit outside of your area but are now delivering to your area, you're going to see a great deal of them focus on this delivery, but with a bottle of wine, a half bottle of wine or beer or and something else. So this is something that I think we're going to uh, see a lot more of, and I hope that you can take advantage of this. And please, like I mentioned before, please send, uh, leave comments and tell us about your your best experiences with these new restaurants as they deliver the food and your drink orders directly to your home. One of the last things I wanted to mention was what we'll be doing with uh, the, uh, Quench Live over the next couple of weeks. We do have. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, an interview with our wine editor, Gervinder Batsia. He'll be talking about international wineries, what they're doing uh, these days, how they've been affected, how farming has changed for them. But also at the same time, he's going to talk a little bit about Zoom tastings and not only give you some insight into what kind of Zoom tastings there are out there, but maybe something that you can put together with your friends if you're able to get the same bottles of wine and enjoy them in a kind of directed tasting through streaming programs. I think it's quite exceptional now that we're doing these kinds of Zoom meetings and, 
And as we're doing here with Quench Live, bringing you these things directly, this is something that I think we will get used to over the next couple of years, uh, over the next couple of months, but I think it'll keep going past that. You know, this is a great way also to connect with friends outside of our areas. And sometimes we don't see them, but enjoying a glass of wine or a meal together in this kind of a setting is sometimes something that you can do. So we're going to be talking to Govinder about that this Wednesday. Please look to Facebook uh, for any of She is the uh, director of uh, an upcoming, uh, well, a documentary that's being done about uh, this uh, opera called The Lake. Now, The Lake is a great project. It's If you get a chance to go to the website you're, that you're seeing listed now, please do. This documentary uh, is about the the opera that was held at Quail's Gate in British Columbia. This winery hosted uh, uh, the, um, the opera and because of uh, the connection with the uh, First Nations, they decided to create this documentary to talk not only about the play itself, but also the production and everything that went into it. So we're going to be talking to Heather a little bit more about uh, the project and how the documentary itself is folding out. But at the same time, if you can, please go to the URL you're seeing right now and support them as they try and uh, finish this documentary. Now, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to see us here at Quench Live. I'll be closing with an interview we did with uh, Tim Posse, Heather's husband, our BC specialist, uh, as he talked to us a couple of years ago about the next big thing in the BC wine industry. And I think he has an interesting insight into how BC and the landscape of Canadian wineries are changing and will be changing over the upcoming years. So we'll close with Tim and his uh, next big thing video, but uh, please look to Facebook as well as some of our other social media to see what we're doing to uh, to do uh, to update you, and also at the same time what the next episode of Quench Live is. So thank you for listening to me. We'll see you on the pages of Quench. Have a good day. I'm Tim Posse. I'm the BC correspondent for Quench Magazine, and I guess that's because I've been here a long time. I I came to wine through BC. Most people come to wine from the old world. My journey was a bit different in that I arrived in BC just when we were beginning to make wine that you could drink and wanted to drink. So I just jumped on that bandwagon and I've, I've learned a lot and enjoyed it ever since. It's a real challenge to keep up with what's happening in BC. There's so much going on. And one thing that's becoming very apparent is our wine region, which used to be very defined as being the Okanagan, is now expanding to several regions and part of that is a factor of climate change so we're now making wines that we couldn't make in areas like Vancouver Island, the Gulf Islands, even places like Lillooet, north east of Whistler, in the Kootenays. These regions were unthinkable even 20 years ago. Nobody suspected we'd be able to ripen Pinot Noir for example even in those regions so that's happening, it's a big thing. And that would lead me to say that the next big thing, ongoing thing, is climate change. It's a reality and we're seeing very rapid shifts happening in BC all the time. Most notably in those smaller, previously borderline wine regions that we just didn't think would happen before. So that's it.